How many of you have ever seen someone in an impersonator? An impersonator. And, and they, they, they make their living, they have particular skill at looking like, acting like, sounding like someone else, right? And, and really, there are times where uh, maybe, maybe you've experienced the opposite, where you have seen someone impersonating and then later seen the real McCoy, seen the real evidence, and it almost, it, it kind of highlights things that this person you haven't met before is doing, right? Often, often impersonation is exaggeration. It's embellishing of these little things. To overcome the fact that someone doesn't look exactly like the other person, they're doing facial features or, or voice inflection or the pattern of their tone to look like the president or to look like a famous politician or a comedian, right? I'm sure most of you have seen that. But what if I asked you, what does it look like to impersonate God? What does it look like to impersonate God? To, not, not in an idolatrous sense, okay? Yes, to impersonate, to take the place of, to pretend to be God is wrong. To act like you are God yourself. But what does it mean to be like God? Maybe I'll just use a Christian term that many of you might have heard. What does it look like to be godly? What does it look like to be godly? Isn't that at some level what we're describing is someone who is living in a God-ish pattern. They have God-ish actions. They, they, in their tone of voice or the words they choose or the pattern in which they speak, act somewhat like God. What does it look like to impersonate God? Well, this, this passage actually is going to explain that, I believe. And we're going to spend some time in this passage explaining what it looks like, the way of life, the set, the set of actions, the pattern of living that is impersonating God. If you remember last week, the, the, the passage we read, Paul says, because of what Christ has done in you as a community and individually, you are a part of God's people who've been called out from a world that's marked by rebellion and, and rejection, right? They're divided amongst each other and separated from God. But in Jesus Christ, who lived perfectly, died sacrificially, and rose victoriously, a people is being gathered who now is reconciled to God and united to each other. This new creation people, this new covenant community, right? And, and these people, they're supposed to be marked by a new style of life. One of them is unity, we've already talked about. The old creation is divided because of sin and death and suffering. And, and, and God's new people, Christ's new people, walk in unity because they have been created into a new community. But they don't only walk in unity, they grow into maturity as they walk in unity because they're each using their gifts to build each other up so that it becomes looking more like Christ every day. And, and one of the ways that, that, that the body Paul is writing to and the body in this room present here needs to grow in maturity is Paul turns his attention to this transformation of leaving behind old living. Leaving behind an old lifestyle that he says, don't live like the Gentiles. And what he doesn't mean is the Gentile culture. He means, because there's a lot of Gentiles reading the letter, he means your unbelieving life, your life before Jesus. Leave it behind and live a new way. Your old life was dead spiritually and destructive practically, right? Remember, indulgence just leads to selfishness and it destroys relationships. But the truth that's taught in Jesus is to see the deadness of those actions and that heart to be renewed, remembering who we are, and to put on new actions. And look what the verse says. It says at 24, created to be like God, the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. These words righteousness and holiness are words that would have fit right into the Old Testament, you think, right? You can't be in God's presence in the tabernacle because he is righteous and you are unrighteous because he is holy and you are not 
Holiness is that God is other, but often means powerful and pure, right? That he is so high above us and so distinct from us in his perfection. Righteousness is basically that God sets the standard for what's perfect. He is the line by which everything else is measured. Well, the process Paul talked about last week was that we would be putting off our old way of living, renewing our hearts with the truth that is in Jesus, and becoming more worthy against the measurement of who God is, and more like God, worthy to be around him, right? Created to be like God. Well, I want to point you in your mind's eye over verses 25 to 32, and look at verse 1 of chapter 5. Created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness is verse 24. And then he says in verse 5-1, follow God's example, therefore. Be like God. Created to be like God, verse 24, in true righteousness and holiness. And then in verse 1, he says, follow God's example. They're, very, they're similar ideas. They're connected ideas. In fact, I think they're going to inform each other. And what I'm going to point to for you this morning is this big idea. Look at verse 1. Follow God's example. Take out that middle, therefore, as dearly loved children. And let me just connect the dots. Follow God's example and walk in the way of love. Created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. He comes down to the end after a bunch of exhortations and he says, follow God's example and walk in the way of love. And here's the answer that I want to give you. What does it look like to be like God? What does it look like to impersonate God? You want to be a God impersonator? Do you want to be godly? Love is the way to be like God. Love is the way to be like God. That's the simple point today. Love is the way to be like God. If you want to impersonate God, love is the path to do that. If you want to act in a way that lines up with our creator and king, our savior, love is the pattern and pathway forward. So you see that connection and I'm gonna, we're going to come back to 25 through 32 today and in the next couple weeks. But first, I want to lay down a principle because before we get to the specific exhortations of what it looks like to be like God, I want us to understand the overarching virtue of love as the path to righteousness and holiness, as the path to godliness, as the path to following God's example. All right? Because God moved for your good even when it cost him. God moved to your betterment, to your salvation, even when it was expensive. All right? That's what Ephesians has told us, right? Chapter 1. What happened? Before the creation of the world, God chose that we would be holy and blameless in his sight. But what did that cost for us to become holy and blameless? The passage says, the one he loves, right? The one he loves was the one who shed his blood. In him we have forgiveness of sins. The redemption redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. In order for you to be brought to God, to be raised out of your sin and your condemnation, in order for you to go from dead in your trespasses and sins... Two, alive with Christ, seated with him in heavenly realms. What had to happen? God worked out your salvation at the expense of his own son. He was so committed to your best interest. He was loving toward you. He was so kind to, instead of punish you, to forgive you through Christ. That that following God's example and walking in the way of love should be seen to us perfectly in the fact that God moves for you even when it cost him. But Paul doesn't just say to them, follow God's example. God's loving, you be loving. He graciously, in these verses 5, 1, and 2, loads, I think, a pathway forward for following God's example. And here's what I want you to remember today. Love is the way to be like God, and in order to be loving, here's what you have to do. Two things. You have to remember who you are, and and you have to remember how you got there. Remember who you are, and remember how you got there. 
All right, so remember who you are. If we're going to be loving is the way to be like God, the first thing we need to do is remember who you are. Look at the phrase, dearly loved children. Dearly loved children. God's love toward you provides an enduring fuel for loving others. It is the kindling for fire of love in your whole life. God's love towards you. You have been loved, so you must, and I should say, so you can love. In Jesus Christ, you are dearly loved children. So let me clarify first. We talked about this in Ephesians, but if somebody's a guest with us today, or if we need reminding, as we often do, we do not start as dearly loved children. We start as hostile to God, rejecting his word, dull to what he has given us and blind to his blessings in our life, deaf to his call in our lives until he interjects, not only with the provision of a savior, but then the work of the spirit. He provided, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to be the savior of the world by by walking perfectly, never disregarding and disrespecting God, never disobeying his word. And then, even though he had been perfect, Jesus obeyed the Father to the point of being the sacrificial death and payment for sin, for sinners. He went to the cross and he died in the place of those who had rebelled against God in order that his death could wipe away their condemnation, that he could absorb the wrath that they deserved. And then he rose victoriously, offering this to all who would turn from sin and trust in him. Those who turn from sin in trust in Jesus, find instead of condemnation, welcome and acceptance. Children instead of enemies. Loved sons and daughters instead of rebels and criminals. Welcomed and loved instead of rejected. This is where we must start first, is that in Jesus, we become God's children. But then many of you, in fact, most of you in the room would say, I am trusting in Jesus. I have turned from my sin and trusted in Jesus. And you know what we can forget? We can forget over and over again is what it looks like to be dearly loved children. And we can't forget this because if we forget who we are, then we will lose the kindling, the fire for loving others. And love is the path to be like God. So let me remind you who you are. You know that we went this weekend, uh, I went up north with my, my kids and my wife, and we went into this restaurant, and, and it was called the Bear Store. And I'd gone to the Bear Inn and the Bear, the bear Store my whole life, basically. They have a bear in a cage there and some wallabies and all kinds of other weird animals. Just a little thing in the north woods. And you can get ice cream and you can eat. And we pull into the restaurant to eat uh, lunch, I think it was. And I ordered a turkey club and Abby ordered a patty melt. And, and you know what? We eat it and we enjoy it. And did you know that Judah didn't offer a dime for his bill? The little rat didn't even come close. He didn't <laughs> offer me anything. He didn't pull out his wallet. I don't even think he brought his wallet. You know why? Because children like Judah, little children don't pay for their food. They don't pay the rent. They are dearly loved in our home, so I'm happy to pay for them. And here's the thing. You are dearly loved children in the eyes of God through Jesus Christ. So you don't have to serve your way into God's family. If you're here attending church, hoping to get accepted by God, you are on a fool's errand. Jesus is the only way we can be accepted by God. And if you are here accepted by God, serving so that God will continue to love you as your child, you are miss, you're forgetting the glorious truth that I didn't think twice when Judah didn't pay for his bill. I was happy to buy him his chicken fries. You know why? Because he's my son and I love him. Children don't pay the bill. You don't have to give to belong. You don't have to earn your position. Jesus earned it for you. And if you are in Christ, you are dearly loved children. Yes, we give 
to the work of the Lord. Yes, we serve. Yes, we belong. But they are things that have happened to us because of Jesus Christ. And we rejoice in them. We don't show up to the table thinking, do I have my wallet? Do I, do, do I have my... Do, do I belong today in the church? Jesus has made us children. My son and daughter know where their seats are at the table because they are immovable in our family. Children don't pay when they break things. You are dearly loved children of God through Jesus Christ. So let me tell you this. As a word of encouragement, your failures and sinfulness is not hanging over your head. You are not in jeopardy. God doesn't do a draft every year and say, well, these Christians have been pretty good. I'm going to bring them back onto the team. These ones have struggled. I'd like to trade for maybe some more useful members of the body of Christ. Actually, in Christ, your guilt has been forgiven, paid for, and is no longer on your account. You don't have to overcome past failures with new righteousness. You need to aspire to new righteousness. I hope my children try to quit breaking things and that they feel sorry when they do break things. And do you realize that when things break, they really break? The gospel of Jesus Christ is not that, that sin no longer has any meaning, that you cannot sin. Yes, you can sin. But do you understand that when you sin, it is not yours to account for. Jesus has paid it all. That when you fail, it is not yours to make up for. It is not yours to kind of slink into the back of church for a couple weeks because you've had bad weeks. And then when you outlive some of that guilt, you can get back in to the body. No, as children, whether you have been doing great or just broke the lamp, dinner's on the table because you dearly loved children. You have hope there. You know this? If that bear at that stupid store had broken out of the cage, it was that's a pretty big bear. Um, I don't think that I would have looked at my pregnant wife or my little children and, and stepped back, I hope, and asked Charlie or Judah to defend me. Right? Because children don't protect themselves. They don't provide a roof over their heads or clothing on their backs or defense against attackers. And you are dearly loved children in Christ, through Jesus Christ. So l l hear me as a word of encouragement. No one and nothing can ultimately triumph over you, and that is not dependent on you. No one, no one can accuse you with a final word against God's word. If God, as your father, has spoken that you are loved and justified with him, that your guilt has been pardoned, and that you have been welcomed to his table, there is no one tapping on the window outside of God's house that says, no, 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 they don't deserve to be in there. You should have seen what they did. You should have heard what they said. You should have seen how they felt about you just yesterday. That is not and never was the way you got to the table of the Lord. My children didn't earn their way into the protection of my roof or the clothes on their back. And I'm a sinful father. How much more will the one who gave his own son so that we could be in the family give us all things? You cannot be out accused, accused out of the family of God. Those accusations may be true, but they have been paid for in Jesus Christ. Now, here's the thing. We planned this little trip because soccer has been taking a lot of time in the evenings, and, and, uh, and I wanted to get a little time with just my, my four there before we come, become five. And, and you know what? Charlie and Judah, didn't, they didn't plan a thing. They didn't pack the cooler. They didn't put any of the, the plans together. Now, frankly, I didn't either. Uh, my, <laughs> my, my wife did, but don't ruin the illustration, okay? The reality is this, that children don't plan for the future. They don't worry about what's coming next or how we will iron out their plans for when they're seven or eight or 18. Do you realize that? You are dearly loved children in God through Jesus Christ, and your future is settled. Your home is secure. You will be taken care of and provided for eternally. 
Anxiety and worry, fear and doubt have no place. Because though this life is full of turbulence, okay, this life is full of turbulence, do you realize that the foundation of your home in eternity with the Lord is laid on the very blood of Jesus Christ? There is, there is no down payment to be made anymore. There is no mortgage in the future that if you miss, you'll be foreclosed on. That God has laid plans for your future. And if you've been justified, how much more, Romans says, will you be saved from God's wrath through him? Your future is secure. One day, if you are God's child through Jesus Christ, you will enter a world where there is no sickness and no sorrow and no suffering and no death, not outside of you or inside of you. And you will live in the very presence, the sight line of God and enjoy him forever. That is for sure because of Jesus, you are a dearly loved child. You don't have to earn your place at the table, provide a roof over your head, or protect yourself from your enemies. The table's been set for you. The placemat already has your name on it. So the first thing you have to do, if if, if being like God is to be loving, if love is the path to godliness, you have to remember that you are a dearly loved child. And I'll tie together why that matters, because Paul calls them dearly loved children. But the second thing you have to do I don't like saying points, but point number two is to remember, remember how you got there. Because look at what the verses say. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Christ's love for you provides an an, an enduring fuel for your position. Remember, what am I saying? You're dearly loved children, and that's immovable because of Jesus. And I'll say this, Jesus' example in his sacrifice is the enduring example for you. How you got there is secure because Jesus did it. But how you got there is also the path forward, not to atone for your sin, but to live as he lived, sacrificially committed to the good of others, laying down self-interest for the betterment of those around him. You have been loved, so you can and must love. John 15, Jesus says, greater love has no one than this. Then they lay down their life for their friend. And then, as 1 John would tell us, Jesus did that exact thing. He laid down his life, by the way, not even for his friends. For while we were enemies, Christ died for us. He sacrificially committed to your good to the point that when he literally was going to experience the rejection of God and punishment for sin and the Roman whips and crucifixion and the grave, he took it up because he said, this will turn out better for them. That is joyful and it is hopeful. Christ took up our sin and died for us and he gave us hope as dearly loved children and an example as people who are to walk in the way of love. He gave us both a hope and a pattern, all right? And we cannot, I think, get either of them left behind. We, if we truly believe Jesus is who makes us dearly loved children, then we will not leave behind embracing a life of love ourselves. But if we just try to embrace a life of love and forget our stable status because of Jesus, then we'll be trying to serve our way into the home of the Father and trying to keep our place at the table because of what we've done. And love is, this, is the commitment to the interests of the other, even at the cost of ourselves. So let me tie together what this looks like. All right? If love is the way to be like God, here's why these matter. Because if I have a secure place at the table in God's home, if I have a firm footing, my chair and my placemat with my name, my mom, we're going to go to my mom's house after this and, and probably eat. And, and a lot of times she'll have in cursive written our names with chocolate. Everybody's name at the table, somebody. And so, you know, Charlie gets two words because it's Charlie May. And, every, you know, you, you always want her to write your whole name because it's just, just liquid chocolate. She melts and she writes our name in cursive at our placemat, right? Even if she doesn't do that today, there's a place for me there. It's my home, right? But if, it's, if that's in jeopardy, and I'm coming over at like, like a business audition, right? Then you know what I'm going to be tempted to do? I'm going to be tempted to put on a face. I'm going to be tempted to impress. I'm going to be tempted to do all kinds of things for me. 
The reason I can't be loving without being dearly loved is because I'm in this game of, of organizing and working for my best interest. But if God has said, you will be accepted, well, then I can quit working for acceptance from anybody below God. I don't need to lie to any one of you, even though I have in the past, I don't know if I've lied to anybody in this room, except for, but maybe I've lied to Abby. I'm trying to think of, but I don't need to lie to you to get your acceptance or protect me from your wrath because I have gained acceptance through Jesus of the Father, the creator of heaven and earth, and the judge of all the earth. I will be accepted. And so if I'm accepted by him, frankly, what's it matter if you say, oh, I don't like you? This is the hope of being dearly loved children and then the fuel, here's how it becomes love. Now I can speak the truth. I can speak for what's best in your life, even if it might cost me rejection or persecution. I can look at the enemy of the gospel in Saudi Arabia or you name the country and say, I can tell you of Jesus and his love and that he is the only savior of the world, even if it might cost me my life. Why? Because I'll receive my life again from the, the, the one who will resurrect his people. I will have a place at the table eternally. I can lay down my life because I want you to have some life, not only this life, right? I want you to have eternal life. I can be for your best interest. And you know what? We don't have anybody probably going to kill us for speaking the truth in here. But we have many people in here who might shut us out or think less of us or punish us for speaking the truth. Even if it's truth about ourselves, this is why we don't confess our sins one to another. Because if I say the truth about me, you're going to realize the truth about me. That I'm ugly. I'm prideful. I'm sinful to the core. And if you find that out, and I have to be a pastor who is above reproach, and the wrong people take the right information and use it against me, I'll lose my job. So I have to protect myself. I have to be friendly with everyone, but friends with no one, as I had a pastor once tell me. That's junk. I'm an accepted by God, and even if I'm not a pastor one day, I'm a Christian. You can't touch me. I'm a Christian because God has accepted me, and I'm a dearly loved child, and I will not lose anything at the table of heaven because of what I do here on this life, I'm not going to pastor my way into the kingdom or out of it. So I can move towards you with love. And you can too. You can move towards others with love. Do you realize this? That, that if I have been dearly loved and no one will ultimately conquer me because of what Jesus has done, then I might have enemies in this life that, that I can love and pray for those who persecute me. You know why? Because, first, I have been dearly loved. God has moved toward me while I was his enemy, and he has given me stability to know that what I just said, one day you'll live in a perfect place with no enemies, no suffering, no sorrow, only living in the sight of God, enjoying him forever. So the fear is temporary. The threat is temporary. The suffering is temporary. And so I can have confidence that it will be handled. The end of the movie, I've seen it. And I know I'm going to make it. And now, guess what I can do? I can move towards those who hate me and persecute me with their best interests in mind because they cannot take this from me. They cannot take my hope in Christ. All I, I can serve them because I do not have to get what I'm looking for now. I can regard my possessions, okay? I can regard my possessions with an open hand. I, I can give away instead of steal because instead of clinging, do you realize that I am waiting for better promises? I am a child of God who will one day live in the global kingdom of the perfect king who has made everything perfect. I'll see Jesus with my eyes and every piece of creation and person that I interact with will be fully delightful and reflective of how good and awesome he is. The best meal you've ever had in this world will pale in comparison. This life is the closest thing a child of God will ever experience to hell. And so these piddly pleasures that we chase after and run for and let capture our hearts are cheap knockoffs that could take us away from experiencing true joy in God and pleasure with him forevermore. 
And so when I know that, and I'm a dearly loved child and I have hope for that, well, then I can be self-controlled with my appetites because this is going to destroy me if it overtakes me. And I can be generous with my resources because what do I need this money for? I mean, frankly, I'm going to be, be sitting in the riches of God forevermore. So for 70 years, if I suffer, it'll be a blip on the radar in eternity. And as a dearly loved child, I can then look and just like the Macedonians say, out of their poverty, they welled up into abundant generosity. Why? Because they now got a picture. Oh, eternally, I'm going to be blessed forevermore. God's plan for my life eternal is to bless me. Well, what do I need a few denarii? What in the world, you know? Like, I mean, a shlingi from Tanzania, a shlingi, right? Or a, or a dollar, this piece of green paper. What is it? It's nothing except for an opportunity, the way Paul says in 2 Corinthians, to participate in the grace of God. He gives us the grace of giving. God can build his kingdom without you, but do you realize he lets you invest on eternity with your green paper? You think God wants your green paper? Well, he lets you give your green paper to invest in eternity and have reward in the new creation. Isn't that wild? That's the change of perspective that comes from going, oh, I, I have a home in heaven, ticket punch for sure, and now I can follow the path of Christ and sacrificially be committed to the good of the other. That, that I, can, I can love. And guys, that's why Jesus said, if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, if you're committed to God above all else, and you love your neighbor as yourself, in doing this, you'll keep the whole law. Because created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness might as well say created to be like God in love. If you're always acting for the good of the other, and the glory of God, you'll never sin. Holiness is actually accomplished by love. So that when I am a dearly loved child through the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I follow the pattern of sacrificial service that Christ laid down for me, I, if I perfectly follow that pattern, I won't sin. That's wild to me. This is why this passage changed my life. And I don't want to get too lost on this, but the reality was this. I didn't like holiness. I'm just going to confess that to you. I thought people who had the reputation of being godly and holy were stuck up and they were no fun to be around and frankly, their lives seemed utterly boring. Like, like, like you could just blow the dust right off them. You're like, what in the world do you do but sit around and think about your own belly button? You're just awful to be around. And, and the fact is that that was an utterly blasphemous picture of holiness that I was receiving probably because of a sinfulness in my own heart and probably that they were giving. If they really believed that's what holiness was, a list of do's and don'ts that they could, hey, we're not under the law, but let's try and get as far under the law as we can. No. What Jesus did, you know what he did? He always thought about God's best interest and the good of others around him, and he never sinned in doing it. So, so sure, we can read, and we will, the next couple of weeks, the list of things that it says put off. Put off falsehood. Okay? I already talked about this. Put off falsehood. Here's the deal. Think about it in terms of holiness, and that's, that's beautiful, okay? Do not lie. But if you go around with just the motivation of do not lie, do, then, then I think you'll be short-sighted. You'll lose the engine. That's why he puts this summary at the end. As dearly loved children, what, what happened? God spoke a word of acceptance, a word of joy and hope, a word of permanent, a permanent accept, uh, acceptance over you. You are my loved child, no matter what you do or what other people think of you. And now, is there any motivation to lie? We lie to protect ourselves. We lie to, we embellish to make ourselves look better. We downplay to make ourselves look better in it the other way, right? To not look as bad. We, we, we lie to hurt other people and advance ourselves. But if God has spoken for my good, if the end of the movie is secure, what do I need to lie for? It's not going to get me any closer to the acceptance God has accomplished. In fact, it's, it's, it's fundamentally contradictory to what God has accomplished on my behalf. Instead, I get to be like Christ and say, you know, I'm going to speak the truth. Even though, as Psalm 15 says, a man swears even to his own hurt. I'm, I'm going to tell you the truth even when it hurts me. I'm going, to, I'm going to speak the truth in love. I'm going to be the kind of person who has so much integrity that, that it might be to my detriment at times. Do you see how it's connected? 
We could just start with don't lie and be holy. What I'm trying to help you see is, yes, holiness is what God is like. But even God is holy by, a, by pursuing this, this love. God is love. That he is acting. That holiness doesn't look like a list of do's and don'ts, but here's what it looks like. It looks like a room full of faces, dominated by the face of Jesus. If you act for Jesus' best interests, and then you act for everyone else in your life's best interests, you will not sin. And it's not because I didn't tell you to. It's actually because you were pursuing something better. And that's why Christian liberty, I don't want to get stuck on this, but that's why all these, these times when people are like, you tell me I can't do this? No, we're not telling you you can't do this. I'm just telling you, you love other people so much that it doesn't even bother you not to do it because you don't want to hurt them. You love them. Oh, well, I, I don't want to get in their way. I mean, I don't, I, I don't want to frustrate them. I don't want to cause their plans to, to have trouble. I don't want to hurt their faith. So, ah, whatever, it's a small thing. I love them. That will flip the script on what holiness looks like and change your life to an, an energized pursuit of thinking, I want to be like God, and I want to do it by loving him. I want to put him above all else and, and let his word guide me into the fact that these people matter more than I do to me. That, that in this room and outside of this room, I'm going to love people, okay? Because if you want to be like God, you got to love. Love is the way to be like God. The big idea today, love is your path to godliness. And you will not love eternally or rightly unless you remember who you are, dearly loved children. And you remember how you got there. Because someone, Jesus Christ, was so sacrificially committed to your good that he took it up at the cost of his own, his own life. He, he did this for you, and he laid a pattern for you. Remember who you are, dearly loved children. There's nothing you need to clamor for or protect. And remember that the way you got there was by Jesus carrying out what the pattern he wants for your life. Love, the commitment to the best interest of those around you. So let me read the exhortations to close. He says, and see if you can hear how these carry out love. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And do not grieve the devil, or do, do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those who need. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may be benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. I no longer need to defend myself because I'm a child of the king. Christ has shown me, purchased my position, and shown me the path of love, so I don't lie. I no longer need to defend myself or execute justice on my behalf because... I'm a child of the king and the just judge. Christ has shown me the path of putting others ahead of myself so I don't gossip or make people pay or turn a cold shoulder or move in violent anger. I no longer steal from employers or take advantage of disabilities or government programs or, or, or dis, disregard bills I owe because I'm not hoping on this world or depending on what I can enjoy here. I have a home firmly purchased in heaven. So I no longer steal, but I actually use my energy and resources for others. I'm generous. I no longer hold, move to, to crush others, but forgive. If you want to impersonate God, you've got to love. And if you want to love, you've got to remember how you've, that, that you are a love child of God in Jesus Christ alone. And then trusting in what Jesus has done, imitate him. Remember how you got there. All right, let's pray together. Father, I pray that you would give us grace to, to love.